Dear Mr. Rector, dear RGSL colleagues and friends, after a few years of break, I'm very happy to back to even virtually to back to my lovely alma mater, Riga Grutet School of Law. I'm very delighted, delighted to be among these um, wonderful authors, and therefore I'm very happy to take place, to be part of this amazing conference and amazing project. But before to start my presentation, I would like perhaps to say that it's very suggestive that my, my paper is first one, presentation of my paper is first one, because it's about human rights. And today is International Human Rights Day. That's why I would like to congratulate all of you wishing to be always protected by your states and rules, but as well wish you to be always promoters of this important principle, respect for human rights. Please give me a few seconds uh, in order to uh, share my screen. Um, could you confirm if you can see this presentation? Okay. So my presentation or the name of my topic is Article 18 of European Convention on Human Rights as a warning shot for non-democracy in Eastern Europe. Um, firstly, I would like to, thank, to say thank you to Mr. George Ulrich for his kind support and help throughout drafting my paper. What was the reason behind uh, to select this topic? I selected this because article of article 18 of ECHR has very a few case law with very strong um, uh, very strong effects and effects on um, Eastern Europe. That's why my aim of this uh, paper is to examine the potential to protect democracy, rule of law, and human rights throughout this article towards Eastern European countries. I will, uh, I will examine the concept of this article further. And I would like to say that I have elucidated and analyzed the case law regarding all these countries, mainly Moldova, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Ukraine, and Russian Federation. I described the current evolution and situation of the applicants throughout the individual gen and general measures implementation towards them. And of course, assess the impact of this case law on uh, these countries, concerned countries. Of course, at the final, I get some um, conclusion and questions to European judges, which I will, which I hope in further uh, case law will be answered. What is it or what means Article 18 of SHR? It is named as limitation on use of restriction on rights. Therefore, this article shall not be applied for any other purpose than those which are provided or prescribed by convention. I understand, in other words, this uh, article as norm or provision which are intended to prevent member states from abusing the ability to respect uh, to restrict rights uh, to a greater extent that is provided in convention. Therefore, this article concerns limitation of rights not for legitimate aims, but for covered uh, those illegitimate reasons. Such provision, no counterpart in another universal treaties. And when I analyzed um, the case law and at another academia, uh, papers, uh, I found very interesting statement that this provision is apparently inutile before to, to be inserted in European Convention. 
This article is inutile at prima facie because it has no autonomous role, but always could be invoked and together with another provision of European Convention, named substantial rights. Looking through um, case law, I have found that this provision always is invoked together with Article 5, uh, right to liberty and security, Article 8 of the Convention, respect uh, for private life and um, family life, and Article 11 of SHR, freedom uh, of assembly and association. Nevertheless, um, this case law is very, um, it's very hard to be, um, um, through this article, the country always has this potential to not be condemned or this article to not be breached out. Because since, because till 2017, the case law um, always has a rule. A mere suspicion that the authorities use their powers in some another purpose, is not sufficient to prove that Article 18 has been breached. Therefore, ECHR raised up a very high standard of proof of violation of the IRS Article. Judge from, from Strasbourg, Strasbourg always started their analysis from the presumptions, but authorities restricted these rights with good intent. Therefore, Till 2017, there were two main rules in case law, this case law. High level of burden of proof, uh, and the, which burden of proof could be and should be rest from applicant, not from government. And even this proof was presented before European court judges, this proof should be very sufficiently convincing and argued. On my next um, slide, I would like to show you or to demonstrate you those cases in which uh, Article 18 was breached. I examined on the, all the case law and uh, some academic papers, and I have found two, 200 cases of eventual alleged possible violation of Article 18 um, of Convention. From them, 40 are, are against Eastern European countries. But at the time when I wrote this paper, I have found 16 cases where uh, countries were condemned. But very important to remember is that eight of them being issued uh, since 2011. Therefore, the court already understood his potential to protect democracy, rule, rule, of, law, rule of law in these countries through Article 18. And I will explain you why, far. From 16 cases, uh, one is regarding Moldova, my country, is case named Chebotar. Mr. Chebotar was um, placed under arrest for some fabricated church in order to sell his private company. Uh, the court found this, that, that arrest and demand of Mr. Chebotar was applied for a purpose other than what was prescribed by convention. Next uh, cases are against Azerbaijan and are there nine Main applicants were opposition leaders and uh, civil society representatives and human rights defenders. Sorry for my pronunciation. I will uh, give you some example. For instance, Mr. Rasul Jafarov, Anar Mamadli, Mr. Ilgar Mamadlov, Rashad Akundov, Intigam Aliyev, etc. They all have a common feature. They are all were subject of criminal proceedings from which court found that constitute a misuse of criminal law and just was intended to punish and silence them. In case of Azerbaijan, unfortunately, court always look 
not only an individual situation of applicant, because it could not be viewed as isolation. Unfortunately, in Azerbaijan's now advanced at this stage, the civil society organization, human rights defenders are persecuted. Next cases, which I would like to uh, further or briefly uh, explain is against Ukraine. There are two cases, uh, case of Lutsenko and case of Timoshenko. They both are former um, politicians and opposition leaders. Uh, Mr. Lutsenko was Minister of Inter Internal Affairs uh, and uh, Timoshenko was former Prime Minister. They both were um, allegedly um, placed in the um, detention remand and their detention did not pursue any purpose. For instance, very interesting that in case of Timoshenko, um, court found that minor in which investigation took place were exceptional because in Ukraine, in case of high level um, uh, corruption, in high level uh, cases, um, the investigation is, is for last for many years, even three, five, six years. In case of Timoshenko, only, only in three weeks. And manner from which this, this investigation was conducted also show us that there are a purpose, another purpose behind. Another county which I covered is Russian Federation, where are, and there are three cases. One is Gushinsky, and second and third is Navalny, Navalny one, Navalny number two. Uh, Mr. Gushinsky was a businessman which has a dispute, commercial gas, uh, dispute with, with Gazprom, a, con a company controlled by state. He was arrested for several weeks and um, um, even his detention was on valid basis. Nevertheless, during the detention period, one agreement was uh, concluded between Ministry uh, or Ministry of Commercial Affairs or Ministry of Ministry of Representative of State and Mr. Gushinsky in order to last one to sell his um, interest on favorable rate. After this agreement was concluded. In detention, Mr. Gushinsky was um, um, free of was acquitted. And second and third cases, Mr. is about Mr. Navalny, uh, well-known Russian opposition leader, uh, blogger, and political activist. He was arrested, arrested, and convicted on separate and different occasions. Uh, for instance, in case number Navalny two was a very interesting situation. He was placed under a house arrest with restrictions with communications, correspondence, not only with his fellows, political um, uh, colleagues, teammates, but as well, uh, he was convicted um, with restriction to not use internet and to not discuss with the society at large. Such situation for court uh, was important because court found breach of Article 18 together with Article 10, breach of freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. At this the next stage, I would like to briefly explain what is the situation of these applicants and what is individual measures and general measures. So far as you know, after the pronouncing of uh, judgments, judgment, it's not a final because here appear a second stage, stage very important, implementation or execution of this judgment. Main basis of this execution process is, is individual measure in a general measures. General measure me means that the state should take all positive uh, steps in order to avoid or to prevent that such violation will never occur. Regarding individual measures, uh, applicants as Shebotar, Gushinsky, Rasul Jafarov, Ilgar Mamadov, Ivan Mirashvili, Timoshenko, after the pronouncing of ECHR judgment, were released or acquitted. Still, uh, Mr. Aliyev is in detention and Mr. Navalny is still persecuted. 
And even you know very well about the situation where he was, his health integrity as well was affected. Regarding general measures, uh, all these Eastern European countries, uh, if even in these countries some judicial and prosecutorial reforms took place, nevertheless, Council of Europe, Committee of Ministers of Council of Europe, got a common feature for them. Poor motivation of remand judgments is still a big problem. Insufficient independence of judges, prosecutorial bias of prosecutor and investigative judges, as well political obedience of some judges and widespread phenomenon of application of arrest in the past are still big issue. That's why in the main or the most of these cases, um, the judgments were not sufficiently implemented. When I say that uh, the practice of high level of proof, burden of proof was uh, the first statement or the first idea of the jurisprudence of Article 18, in 2017, this situation was changed. Is, is due or thanks to first case Meravishvili West for Georgia and Grand Chamber. After this uh, judgment, the case law started, or as I wrote, trigger, trigger to change. No longer will European Court require this incontrovertible indirect proof. This essence is a matter to determine the predominant purpose. If the predominant purpose was illegitimate, then Article, of Article 18 will be violated. In 2019, was the confirmation or more positive step in evolution of case law through Navalny versus Russia, number two. And ECHR turned to look behind appearance to deal this, measure, uh, this mix of measure, which it doesn't matter which purpose is first, legitimate or illegitimate. If court will look in them, how we could name converging contextual evidence. So it means that court not will look not only in individual circumstances of a case, but as well will look on general situation of the country. If the According to international reports, Council of Europe reports, civil society reports, analysis and studies, the situation of human rights, rule of law, democracy in this country is affected. Moreover, Article 18 will be likely violated. And uh, briefly, a uh, few conclusions which I made uh, after uh, analyzing case law and reading my, my, writing my article. Article of art, article art 18 is under transformation. And I confident that already court understood his potential to protect human rights in these countries and will look and will go further in this regard. As well, it's a paramount for European court to consider very high and sensitive political context of our countries. But as well, I raised up some questions to uh, European judges, and I will be waiting for their responses. For instance, if this provision could be applied to, let's say, ordinary people, because so far as I understand, Article 18 was applied before for towards opposition leaders, political leaders, civil society representative. But do not forget if the country as it, as some regime from our Eastern European countries uh, are going to affect human rights in general. Why this article could not be applied to ordinary people? And second question, if the, if the article six of the CHA, right to fair trial in conjunction with article 18 will be applied. In theory, it's not possible because uh, this article do not, does not contain restriction clause restriction clause per se, but do not forget if there are some lack of independence of judges, political obedience, even self-censorship between judges, why the process 
uh, under well, uh, exam, okay, trial process could not be political affected at all. Thank you for, for attention. And uh, you, I will be very proud if, or very happy if you will have some comments or questions towards me. Sorry, I had some emotion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, indeed, now is the time for questions. But uh, before we proceed, I would like to remind the audience that you can ask questions um, below the streaming window, entering the code on our way to 2030. Uh, and um, now I invite my colleagues, uh, Rector Sulo and Eva Milun, a lecturer at the Rick Graduate School of Law, to lead the Q&A session. Thank you very much, uh, Anastasia. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Daniel, for your presentation that, um, especially on such a day as today, I find uh, uh, extremely uh, topical and uh, uh, extremely uh, interesting. It's always uh, great to hear about uh, human rights. Um, if I may, uh, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, I was intrigued by your last remark uh, which, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, means, implies that Article 18 has a stronger potential because it could be used, let's say, for a, if I may use this expression, for a broader audience, which transcends uh, political leaders, uh, uh, human rights defenders, and uh, people who are uh, in the spotlight. Uh, I would like to ask you if you can elaborate uh, uh, a little bit uh, on this. And also, I mean, one of the key uh, pillars of your uh, paper uh, is that uh, Article 18, uh, the use of Article 18 is particularly relevant for Eastern Europe. I was wondering if you have also interest encounter uh, during your research interesting cases of uh, use of Article 18, which are not targeting uh, Eastern Europe, but other country of the Council of Europe. And what are the differences in this case? Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Rector, thank you for your question and for appreciation. I will start to, to respond to your first question. I um, Without distinguish, let's say, any particular country from Eastern European country, it's very, uh, it's very, it seems that very often the violation is towards uh, opposition leaders in order to reduce their to silence, to do not give their possibility to discuss with public, with public, and with civil society representatives and human rights um, promoters. But relying on these aspects, therefore, if the if your if your government restrict the the rights to liberty and security, the right to freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, the right of individual uh, and personal life, that's why my question was: if the county goes uh, in terms of repressions with, uh, towards these political leaders who who already have some fellows beyond them that's why why we we this situation we can do not affect human rights of whole society that's why me as ordinary people could i bring a claim uh to european court under article 18 but i will will not have a sh um, assurance that this provision will be um uh let's say triggered by uh, European court judges. Let's see, is there less uh, like open question to, to further development of uh, case law from Strasbourg court? It's like from, from theoretical perspective, but I'm looking forward for practical terms as well. Um, relying uh, your second question, um, sorry, um, yes, I am, I observed that um, not only Eastern European countries were affected uh, by article, affected in positive terms by, by article uh, 18. A lot of case law were pronounced by European court uh, towards Turkey. And the main 
issues which were raised up by court is pretty similar with the countries from Eastern, uh, Eastern Partnership, Eastern, Eastern Europe countries. It's like illegal uh, arrest, uh, and arrest and demand and uh, detention of uh, reclama applicants. Applicants are men, civil society uh, representative and human rights and lawyers from Turkey. Uh, as well, um, there are few attempts to breach uh, the Article 18, uh, but finally the court didn't find last violation towards Latvia, for instance, uh, and. Um, Sorry, I just uh, remember these countries. Turkey uh, is the, the main actor in this aspect. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, too. Uh, yes, if I... Uh, I can... Manage. So, uh, could you repeat once again, because I can hear you. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Gajnic, thank you very much for your presentation. If I may ask you one more question. Uh, human rights have uh, been partic become particularly vulnerable in the case of COVID crisis. And uh, many states, including Latvia, had made derogations from the European Convention on Human Rights in times of COVID. My question is, do you think that the Eastern European uh, states are more vulnerable in this respect than the others? Thank you for your question. <laughs> it's a very good question. I know that such countries as, as from Eastern European as Moldova and Armenia, um, let's say trigger or started uh, put, put uh, to, towards Council Europe, their application on the activation of Article 15 of the uh, European Convention. Um, actually, I don't know if talking about comparison, if the Eastern European or other countries will be affected more or less, but take into account that um, these countries have like uh, this authoritarian uh, potential, uh, totalitarian and oligarchic potential to, to build the democracy, so-called uh, democracy in the country. This restriction could be used, of course, I mean, restriction during the COVID-19 could be used uh, uh, by them. Um, I will give you some, uh, it's, it's, it's very hard to give you some examples now because I, this question is no, it's not um, analyzed by me, by my paper. But it's a good question for further reading of another article <laughs> in this regard. <clears throat> Anastasia, do you think we have time for uh, another question? We definitely have time for one more question. Uh, so definitely, no problem with that. Yes, if I may, um, uh, I was also <clears throat> intrigued by, in your paper, uh, by the analysis of uh, the implementation of the judgments. Uh, I would like to ask you, I mean, what, what have been currently uh, the major challenges in the implementation? And of course, on the basis of your research, whether you, what are your projections in, the, in this regard, whether these challenges will be uh, overcome in, in the near future. And very shortly, I mean, if I may, it's something that I would like to ask to all uh, speakers today. I mean, uh, what are the new skills that you have accrued uh, in conducting this research uh, for RGSL? To what extent do you think that you have gained skills that can be beneficial also in your um, uh, professional life beyond academia. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you for questions. Um, firstly, I would like to say that um, in my um, activities, I mean, at my office, I'm involved in the um, ECHR analysis, mainly uh, implementation or execution process. Um, 
For instance, uh, this is very complex and very hard process. Uh, changing of legislation and changing of uh, um, judge practice, prosecutor practice is very complicated. It's not sufficient just to amend the legislation, but the put in the practice these this provisions is very case secret of the whole implementation process. Regarding all this question, all these countries, there are a uh, few common features. The political part, I mean, legislative or government or president, depends on the constitutional structure of each country, has very strong influence on judiciary. That's why since the moment that this, this political interference will not be stopped, I'm afraid that the situation of this council will not, this bad situation of this council will not be changed. We can modify, we can adopt a new legislation according with Council of Europe rules, but even at the national level, the practice will not be changed. I'm afraid the situation will be the same. And the new, new judgment, and not only about Article 18, will be pronounced by uh, European courts toward these countries. What kind of skills? <laughs> a very, very interesting question because um, before to analyze Article 18, I analyzed, let's say, substantial rights as uh, Article 5 and Article 3. Article 5 is um, freedom, uh, liberty, and security, and Article 3 is um, torture uh, and ill treatments. And now I'm, I was, let's say, needed to think beyond of these uh, substantial rights. I needed to look this, not only my counties. And second aspect, I started to think largely because I understand that democracy, it's not only in one individual counties, but need, need to have democracy in neighborhood counties is the same important because the democracy, it's not only about territoriality, it's universal. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, sorry. If, I thank just wanted to thank the speaker. Sorry. Right. Thank you too. Thank you, Daniel. Once again, great opportunity.